Thank you, Reggie. I am so filled with joy from that meditation. I actually cried during the break. I am so grateful to you and to the Sangha because it has been such a challenging 24 hours. And my New Year's resolution is to try to have more equanimity and not just be as annoyed of a human being. And as you were guiding us through the meditation, and I love that you said, I don't remember the exact word, I'll look it up, but the kind of Buddhist that is active. Yeah. And that's the only way I know how to practice. But you gave me the gift of the question, is there a more loving way to handle this? Mm -hmm. And instead of my usual response is to just fix things or try to get through things, is there a more loving way to handle this? And to really stop and check in with my heart before I run off with my mouth. <laughs> and that I think will, it certainly has changed my day. The people I was the most annoyed with, I just couldn't be mm -hmm. through your meditation as I felt the heart expand. And I am going to carry this with me forever. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, it's an honor to hear that and receive that because that's what keeps me coming back to these practices, right? Like, it's like, oh, I can feel like this. I could love this much. I, I, wanted, I want to love more, right? So, um, Auntie. Uh, yeah, yeah, I uh, first of all want to say thank you and thank you to the Sangha. I was more um, deeply humbled by the experience. And what really struck me tonight in the flow is when we connect with loving kindness and we connect to the heart and we connect to the collective energy of the Sangha. In the recent teach, uh, teaching from a um, um, Hawaiian um, and the explanation of aqua chords, the chords of connections, we create a field. And when we use our int intention with the field, it's just so beautiful. And when you connect with the heart, the heart will take the imagination and creativity where it wants to go. And it was such a beautiful journey. And I'd never really experienced the we. Um, it wasn't so much the two legged but it was our elder brothers. It was the birds. It was the animals. It was the oceans. It was the forest in Brazil being burned down. It was the oceans and the rivers. And I love your words. It's almost as if you, um, just speak from the heart, but you're connected to your higher self, whatever it is that feel. And I just want to say blessings from my ancestors to yours with great humility. Thank you. Received with gratitude. I um, I didn't mention so that you so my ancestors just threw you tapped me on the shoulder. I didn't mention them. Sorry, y'all. So like I acknowledge my ancestors, especially in Black History Month, because my incarnation is the answer to the is the answer to the supplication right like their fervent prayers put this big bold black brother on earth right now you know what i mean like it used to be illegal for black folks to read i went to yale right it used to be illegal for black folks to vote i was the chief strategist and political officer at move on you know what i mean so like so like one of my yoga teachers called me the karmic destroyer he was like whatever your ancestors dealt with they put it on you to take it out so i acknowledge my ancestors for without them i don't exist so thank them for talking to you to get me to <laughs> remember them right so i, I appreciate that and thank y'all for your shares and we'll have time to, to speak at the end um and because this is what gives me life right like so the, these sorts of connections but to transition back to talk and stuff so for those of you who do not know the song loves in need of love today get it in your life y'all right right it's seven minutes of sonic bliss through the musical genius of stephen morris otherwise known as stevie wonder and i'm going to read <laughs> It's gonna be hard for me to read because I'm used to just singing this song at the top of my lungs, but um, I'm gonna read some of the lyrics uh, to talk about why I did the meta meditation the way that we did, right? <laughs> Not yet, Shirazi. I appreciate that though. Um, so the lyrics are, good morn or evening friends. Here's your friendly announcer. I have some serious news to pass on to everybody. 
What I'm about to say could mean the world's disaster, could change your joy and laughter to tears and pain. It's that love's in need of love today. Don't delay, send yours right away. Hate's going round, breaking many hearts. Stop it, please, before it goes too far. So that's the first lyric or the first stanza. And while some may be tempted to see that as um, dour, it's a plea. Like love needs your help right now. You know, love is in the realm of other spiritual um, things such as truth. It needs to be expressed. It needs to be spoken. Once it's expressed and once it's spoken, it'll do what it needs to do, <laughs> right? But if we don't express our truth, Claudia, it's, I'll type it in a minute. It's love's in need of love. Actually, this is the, this is the Spotify for it. So love and truth need to be expressed. So going back to um, our meditation, did you feel the connection that not only we all shared, but think of it in like quadratic time, right? So we resourced ourselves and then some of us stayed there, but then some of us were like, okay, I'm gonna give this to somebody else. Then I'm gonna give this to all of us, whatever all of us felt like for you. That is loving love, right? That's like tending to the needs of love. And when and the beauty thing, so we're about three weeks away from the anniversary of the coronavirus, y'all, like the lockdown portion of it. And just to backtrack a bit, you know, if you turn into the news or doom scroll Twitter, you might think that the world is over, you know, and in my socially engaged uh, Buddhist training through the Upaya Zen Center, we had the blessing of having uh, Elder Joanna Macy uh, christen our, our Sangha. And Elder Macy basically said, we're either at the beginning of the end of humanity or we're at the beginning of our renaissance. Either way, it's sacred. So be a steward of this sacred moment. That blew my mind. <laughs> I was like, whoa, they're both sacred? And the only way that one can see both is sacred is to not only have supreme love, but non-attachment. Right, so when we were sending love to ourselves and love to one another and love to the, the collective, that is the most powerful force without attachment. So by proxy, it gives us the opportunity to transmute suffering. So, you know, the, the, the pain we feel in our culture right now is the byproduct of centuries of delusion. Right. Whether it be um, and we all know that delusion is one of the root causes of suffering. So we turned a blind eye to the slaughtering of indigenous communities for hundreds of years. Like we forgot that enslaved humans, the slaves, no, they're enslaved humans who had their own lives before they were brought here and put to work. Um, the extractive industries which pollute many and enrich few. Right. So the time is right and right for us to consider new ways of being together and the best part of meta practice and loving ferociously is that it's not new <laughs> it's been around for thousands of years there are sent there are civilizations that um were predicated on love and kindness you know like capitalism is only 150 years old right so like who says now in this re-emergence of the pandemic from the pandemic that we can't adopt the new way of being right and we, like I said, we're three weeks away from the third anniversary of the pandemic lockdown. And in many ways, it's the first anniversary because um, we were still in the pandemic in 21 and 22. We didn't know what was really happening. So this is like the first, um, it doesn't have the specter of like ubiquitous fixation on the fragility of the human experience. And because it's passed from the headlines, for many in our society, the suffering that we carry has passed from our awareness. Which leads me to the crux of our conversation. You know, the prevalence of impermanence and the reminders of our mortality have subsided, but our collective grief, confusion, and pain has only become more pronounced. And 
that doesn't, that's why loving kindness is so important. So when we talk about compassion, I don't view it in a passive sense, like most, like, like most people tend to do. For me, it's an action. Like I love so deeply, it requires me to stand in the breach. It requires me to ask how you're doing. It requires me, I'm, I'm an activist, so it requires me to go to the heart of a problem and stand there and see what I can do about it. And there are times when I can't do anything, <laughs> but there are times when I can do something. And it's when I resource myself with that love and do that something, that is the in, that's the interjection of loving kindness in, in action, right? So what we need on this planet right now is a ferocious compassion that can stand in the breach that can hold the joys and sorrows of our collective humanity and hold space for more healing and less judgment, right? We don't have the bandwidth we had anymore, y'all. <laughs> you know, people are like, I'm on vacation. I was like, you can look that miserable at your house, <laughs> right? Like, I flew around the world to go on vacation. I'm just as exhausted. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know. So m most, spirit most spiritual truths, are only as powerful as their expression. So silent truth is not the same as embodied truth, empowered embodied truth expressed. Theoretical compassion is not the same as ferocious compassion rooted in the unleashing of the wisdom of the heart. The wisdom that know the wisdom of the heart is the is the wisdom that knows there's no separation between us other than what we fixate upon. The wisdom of the heart is the wisdom that knows that the power of sharing and caring is far more powerful than selfishness and apathy. It's the wisdom that knows that non judgmental loving awareness, when combined with loving kindness, reveals the poetry that exists in the present moment. The poetry that, when expressed, sets in motion things that thaw the coldest heart and soften the hardest head. Right. Trust me, if you had told me five years ago, hey, Reggie, you're going to be like teaching sanghas around the world. I was like, yeah, right. The practice got me, y'all. <laughs> the practice was like, get over here. Right. And so, I, you know, I kind of fell into it. And so when Stevie Wonder talked about love's in need of love today, it's as relevant as it was in 1976. It's as relevant as it was when civil rights elders talked about building the beloved community. Compassion compels us to act, and I'm living testimony to that. Um, last night, I told you about the Valentine's Day Sangha for the Brokenhearted on, on, on a, in a Grief Sangha. And y'all, the bearing witness to transformation of suffering like that was the most beautiful thing I've seen in my life. It was like it was the, as a blessing as a teacher to hold that space because I saw the actual rendering of metta as opposed to the theoretical right like the power of words and intention in community people who you know one woman lost her husband six weeks ago and said i still feel joy today and it's because i'm here and then i was like oh this compassion stuff is out of this world <laughs> it's just like whoa i really didn't know like i'm just the conduit but i was like whoa so you know I hope to create the same circumstance in, in, in this Sangha. So when we lean into the power of heart connection, things change, y'all. And love is the only force in the universe that has the power to stare hate in the face, smile, wrap its metaphorical arms around it, squeeze it, then transform it. So those are all of my remarks. Uh, I've said a lot. And so I'd like to take a moment of silence just to allow that to land. And then I'd love to hear your questions and comments because I believe in that. So let's just take a moment to shift shoulders, shift neck, find the breath. deep gratitude for the chance to be of service. Any questions or comments, dear ones? Let's, um, let's, let's wrap. And I, and I, I'm the teacher that means it. 
<laughs> right? Like some people are like, any questions or comments, they don't want nobody to say nothing. That ain't me. Elaine. And Elaine, if you can turn on your video camera, that would be great. Yeah, I can't because it'll freeze the laptop. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. um, Reggie, not to. Thank you so much for your words. Um, the question that comes up for me, maybe because of one of the last things that you said about wrapping hate with love in, in your heart. And I, you know, here in the Sangha, the experience of that meditation there's, it's very powerful and, and it feels like maybe there's no choice except to act. But I really want to ask something about courage, which is very interesting because that's what the French word for heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, cool. yeah. It sounds to me like you'd need a hell of a lot of courage to stand up to some, some events, people, things who seem so filled with hate and rage. Um, can you can you talk about that? I mean, are you just mm -hmm. over, overtaken with love that there's no other choice but to stand up to that, which would be really great, you know, or I mean, there's like seems to me you need need a lot of courage or something, you know, right. Thank you, Thank you very yeah. much. Now, for sure. I love that you uh, talked about the root um, because that's what when I learned or when I felt that uh, the repetition of these practices was strengthening a muscle or creating a, a, a skill. Um, that's when I was like, hmm, right? And so I have become so loving of self that that means I set hard boundaries, you know, like I've been in meetings and someone talked to me like crazy. I'm like, peace and blessing. No one talks to me that way. Like I respect myself too much to receive that. You know what I mean? That it, it I'm so resourced on that, that it's almost courage is a byproduct of that. Like for me, it's such such deep practice of, and I, I've had to, you know, someone asked me to speak about anger. This is where I'll, I'll weave that in. Um, as a black man in the United States of America, the way they treat us, they don't care about us, man. They don't. I mean, we see that all the time. And so to be consistently gaslit and to be, um, I'm wicked smart, but everyone called me stupid because of the color of my skin. And so like it creates a anger within you that becomes toxic and it infests all of your life. And so like I had to realize that I was killing myself with my anger and I had to start loving myself to heal myself. What I didn't know that I was doing is that I was practicing compassion towards self, towards self. I was building the Care Bear stare. <laughs> Right. I didn't know that. Like, I was just trying to make it through. I was like, yo, I'm tired of hating myself. Or I'm tired of being gaslit and treated like shit. You know, I'm tired of this. Like, that's how I got started into it. But I kept doing it again and again and again. And then someone would say something to me and I would out of nowhere be like, nah, I ain't doing that. Or I would quit my job. I was like, I ain't doing this no more. You treat me like, you know, like, so this thing, these things would just manifest. And I was like, oh, <laughs> whew, right. Like, you care for yourself so much that there's some things that you just won't hold, right? And so for me as an activist, when I realize that, okay, so how can I pair this with my activism? So for my activism, I have to be so strong and, you know, I won't get into it too much, but if you look up the impeachment of the first president, um, I was intimately involved in that. And um, I had to hold space for members of Congress. Like I taught meditation to like Rashida Tlaib and uh, Deb Holland and like Ilhan Omar and, and them in the midst of the ridiculousness of, of, the, of the 116th Congress. I could only do that because of my own preparation. And what I didn't know then is that I was serving so freely from the heart that they began to see me as teacher. I thought we were just homies. Like Ayana was like, you're a healer. I was like, sister, what are you talking about? But I didn't know that like my personal practice was also benefiting them, right? So when I get into the debt, so for me, I started practicing, I didn't say this at the beginning, I started practicing yoga and meditation to not curse out my boss. Like it wasn't to pursue enlightenment. It was, to, this lady was about to catch it. Like she had, like I'm from Baltimore. If you've seen The Wire, I'm not that far from there. And um, she just was saying these ridiculous things to me in staff meeting. and. I was this close to saying MFB, do the math, right? You know, and I was like, if I say that, I'm gonna get fired. 
and rightfully so because you shouldn't be cursing out your boss like that but she shouldn't be treating you like that so the depth of my meditation practice began out of personal necessity and it's become a tool that i didn't even know that i was building for to hold space for some ridiculous moments so that's kind of a long-winded answer um but that's a bit of my personal application of this theoretical experience You're, you're welcome. Three exclamation points. I guess that means I did it. Um, uh, so Jackie, yeah, so the reason I put that out there, I, um, I'm in this writing program and they tell people to step outside your um, comfort zone. I kept a journal for 40 years because that's how I could navigate the world, right? You know, I'm in these crap situations and I would just like write in my journal. So I never had an intention to share it. So when you're in a writing program and they start calling you author, they're like, yo, you're not an author if you don't tell people about your book. So I am 29,000 words into a manuscript called The Path to Active Peace. Um, we're working with publishers and stuff, um, but if you if you sign up to hang out with me, it'll, it'll be out there in, a, in a, probably about 12 months, but we'll see. Um, Becky G, and thank you for forcing me to talk about it. Like, if I didn't see the question, I would have totally for anyway, like, even teachers are human, <laughs> right? Like, Becky, please. Um, uh, Reggie, I would like to know, how do you overcome the feeling of being judged and wanting to withdraw? Because, like, I live alone, mm -hmm. and during COVID, it it's been three years of basically going through life, I don't know, beating, beating a path through the bushes or something. Mm -hmm. and some days it really gets to me. But you seem to have a lot of inner bounce. And I would like to know, how do you do that? How do you get that going and keep it going? I need some of that. <laughs> well, <laughs> Thank it's, you. Um... No, you're welcome. Um, but then I'm glad that you mentioned it the way that you did, because y'all, we all went through the coronavirus. We all did. The entire world did. So we're all a little bit off, if we're being honest, right? For those people, I have my stuff together. I'm like, yo, did you just experience what I went through? Because <laughs> I don't even know. But like, so I say that to say, you giving voice to how you feel is an act of balance. Right? We live in a society that forces us to suffer in silence. And so you talking about how do I do this? But so that requires strength, courage, and balance. So you're closer than you think, for real though. And the other part I would say to, to answer your question is that um, I had to learn to be able to sit with what I wasn't comfortable with. And once I got comfortable with being uncomfortable, I'm like, oh, well, I'm comfortable with this, so let's try some new stuff, <laughs> right? So I, I, I normalized being uncomfortable. That's the blessing. Yeah, it's super tough. For, but, you know, I, I really enjoy um, like tough assignments. But the easy way I would say, or easier way, is just figure out, well, one is like get comfortable with being uncomfortable. The other is like find ways to be joyful for no reason. Right, because we live in a society that doesn't want us to be happy, that doesn't want us to exclaim joy. And I come from a tradition of black radicals, like you can take my dignity, but you will not take my joy. <laughs> right, you know, you can create Jim Crow, you can like change the rules again, you can do all this stuff, you will not take my joy, you will not take my integrity, right? So like, and that celebration for no reason other than being alive, the presence with the gift of life, that puts a little pep in your step and that's balance. And like, if you're like me, you like a little bit of spice in, in, in your food, right? And so for me to be de defiantly joyful gave me tremendous balance in a society that made me feel terrible. Is that helpful? That's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. I'm gonna, Thank you. I'm gonna have some spice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> For sure. Peace to you, Becky. Carol, please. 
Carol, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry. There you go. There you go. There you go. I'll read my chat. It's not over, folks. Think of our older and compromised folks before you rip off your masks. I'm 85. And now, now being masked seems to be, quote, almost a sin amongst many popular of uh, many people in this is this country. That's it. Yeah, thank you for that. Like that's the compassion requires us to hold space for that. So thank you for that. Um, I, I still mask up everywhere I go. I, I'm seeing my grandmother tomorrow. She's 96. You better believe I'm going to have a mask because that's not going to. Yeah, I got to take care of mama. Monica. Hi. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your your um, sharing your wisdom. And really, it is very insightful. And today, no less than what you said is like the, the, the culture or the system can take away dignity. Well, your, jo your dignity, but not your joy. And I really appreciate that. That is a very profound message um really like uh today i was listening to another audio and it really says that we're joy inside and really there's nowhere to look for it but inside and no one can take it away so thank you so much for that and reminding me of that jewel in the heart thank you absolutely and just to reference what we just experienced in meditation wasn't that like joy everywhere <laughs> Right, so light and free, and I'm happy for no reason other than I just sat with my hand on my heart with 300 people for 30 minutes, right? Like, so, like, that joy is so present, we just have to choose it. Jane. And if you can put on your camera, that would be great. I will do. There we go. Thank you, Jane. Hi, Reggie. It was wonderful to hear your wonderful enthusiasm and, and uh, forthrightness and speaking the truth right out loud. But I have a, a little bit of a question for you and maybe a request. Um, a lot of us have been homebound and really socially isolated, as Carol may have inferred. Yeah. Uh, it's not real safe to go out and flaunt around too much. I'm, I happen to be a little younger than Carol. I'm only 82 as of February <laughs> 6th. But anyway, long story short, I'm awful long. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you if you had any ideas for some of us who are, are not in the public, yeah. not able to, I, I happen to be handicapped too, not able to be out there. Mm -hmm. Do you have, I mean, I, of course, can do loving kindness meditation, and I do every day and ask that I can be a blessing to myself and others every day, but I'd really like some ideas, because where there are, let's see, what's that saying from the Bible, where there is no vision, the people, people perish. perish. So at least I could be witness to that, but do you have any ideas for some of us who aren't, can't get out and about and walk the streets and do the stuff that besides contribute money or something. Yeah, so I appreciate you saying that because I'll also say that my stories are mine. Like not everyone is called to do the wild stuff I've been called to do. In fact, when I first got the call, I hung up the phone, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I was like, Reggie, that's because I'm named after my father. I'd be like, that's my dad, you ain't talking to me. Then they called back like Reginald Alton Hubbard II. I was like, oh, okay. Um, I mean, and that's not to diminish um, the, because we felt it at the end of our meditative practice, we felt into the universe that exists beyond um, ourselves, our, our, limita our, our limited notion of ourselves. So I believe that when you, when one puts um, love into the universe, you know, when I talked about my ancestors' prayers, like my, my mother, both my grandmothers um, were praying women like intent, intention-filled, loving women. And so my mom wakes up every morning at five o'clock and like says her prayers and for the, for the benefit of all. And that's the house I grew up in. And her mm -hmm. mama did that. And my dad's mama does that, right? And so that is more powerful than we give credit for. My strident comments are meant for people like myself <laughs> who are my age and don't understand the necessity of putting spirituality into practice. 
right? Putting practice into practice is beautiful. So definitely did not mean to diminish that. But to answer your question, like specifically, um, there are ways for, I mean, there's a tre tremendous epidemic of loneliness. Yes, and I wanted to ask you to please put out a plea. If you have an older person in your neighborhood or you've forgotten about your grandma or your auntie or somebody, uh, just once in a while, connect because we really appreciate that. And I, uh, I speak for a lot of other people, not myself. I'm fairly well resourced. I have the best neighbor in the world, but you know, we all get lonesome sometimes. I guess we have it in common. I, I learned a new term today. It's awful to be dating these days. There's such a thing as catfishing. I didn't know that. I didn't know that, what that was. I had asked somebody and I found out and I, I don't, I'm sort of glad I, that day is over for me. <laughs> glad. I know. I'm glad, but uh, how are you all doing out there that uh, the single people that, uh, I mean, this is the time for mating for, what is it, somewhere between 18 and 30 or 40? I don't know. But uh, my goodness, we've got lots of interesting life uh, dilemmas, don't we? Uh, yeah, I love that. So you, you'll be pleased to know that um, I do a, a monthly sangha with Sharon Salzberg called Sitting at the Feet of the Elders. And so what we're doing is creating an opportunity for people to reach out and reach back. So I will take your words directly to our sangha in a couple of weeks, um, saying that Jane told us that what, Sharon, Jane told us that what we're doing. I know is, Sharon. So tell her hi from Jane from Michigan. Okay. I will. I will. I will. Thank you. Yeah, I love sure. Sharon and all the gang over there. Yeah, she um, she's adopted me and she started to make yeah. fun of me and I, I receive it because <laughs> it's super and, you know, and can I point out, she's Please. become a real social activist in the last couple and during COVID more than yeah. I ever realized. I, I think she's always been active, but really socially out there. Yeah, that, that, that's why she and I get along. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> and just give my love to everybody up there. I will. Blessings to you, Jane. Thank you. Ruby. Hey there. Um, Hair Bears are my philosophy. Starting at three, I watched it and I was like, this is it. This is everything that matters in life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but one thing they, I guess, whatever, it's a kid's movie, so they didn't talk about like, deep shame and I'm talking about yeah. shame from childhood trauma because I keep having this you know my anger that I'm processing and under that's a tremendous amount of grief and also a lot of shame is coming up for me shame about how I grew up right you know my parents have done a really good job mending or repairing emotionally with me but there's still so much shame you know my parents were hoarders and abusive and like it's coming out in all these ways with me. So like in meditation, I can go to that sweet, soft place. Mm -hmm. And then I struggle to carry that with me when I get triggered or activated or frustrated with myself. A lot of it is like my own internal battles of accepting myself right. and my limitations. I'm also neurotypical of ADD. So like every hour is another moment where I'm like, ah, oh, mess that one up, you know? Maybe not every hour, but many hours right. I struggle to live in this world, which is not totally compassionate of neurotypicals. And it's very hard to summon that and to not fall into shame or lack or feeling like I can't keep up. Right. So my uh, my partner has ADHD and um, I'm very uh, conversant in ways of making my practice amenable to all. <laughs> Right. So the, the blessing of that is like, she's like, Reggie, you kind of, you know, she gives me like tips all the time. What I know for myself is when it was hard for me to be kind to myself, that's where this would matter to me. Right. Like, Red, like, Reggie, you're so stupid. That's the dumbest thing. I'll put my, you know, and like, it would be like a Pavlovian, like, be kind to yourself, man. You know what I mean? Like anything that for me was physical to disrupt the chain of thought for me, right? Um, like finding a compassionate way to interrupt that and be like, I'm doing the best that I can, or that was not for me, right? You know what I mean? So creating, so rather than doing a 25 minute meta practice, making it like 10 seconds, 
right? Or, you know, when I said, like, maybe put the, like, finding a way of being tender with yourself. That's why I said during the meditation, I was like, this may not be doing it for you. Maybe it's this, like finding a way to be physically, the body understands touch sometimes better than words. Right. So if you offer yourself a tender touch, the brain will be like, oh, wow, right on. Right. And the words will be like, oh, that touch was, you know, like it's, it's, it's kind of finding a way to disrupt it with compassion. And then when you're in compassion practice, just try to stay there as long as you can so that when you come and make that or that or whatever it is, like it takes you to that spot that you have been building over time. Make sense? Cool. Thank you, Ruby. Anything, anyone else, dear ones? Don't uh, be shy. Maybe I'll go. Yeah, please go for it. Um, but you, you used the word fierce compassion or ferocious compassion. Could you speak to that a little bit? What, yeah. What, how does that show up for you? What's that like? Um, so it's kind of a derivative of what we talked about um, in terms of courage, right? So if we do heart work, that doesn't engender cowardice, right? It engenders for me courage. And once you have this abundance of courage for me, the fierceness is then doing something with it. You know, like for me as like a hardcore activist, standing up and being like, nah, enough, you know what I mean? Or this won't happen anymore. Or in some of my political work, we're doing we're setting up a political action committee to deconstruct racial uh, animus in criminal justice reform, right? So no, not for the faint of heart, but um, my, my, my spiritual practice requires me as black dude to get directly into the heart of a situation that destroys us, right? So I'm going to work on criminal justice reform issues and set up a political entity like that is the Care Bear stare, but then going directly into it. So the fierceness is like, okay, I see this harm being done to fill in the blank, and I'm going to do something about it, <laughs> right? You know, I mean, I have a pretty ferocious Joppa practice, <laughs> right? You know, like these beads, like people are like nice necklace. I was like, don't touch them; they're preyed on. You know what I mean? Like so. Like this is definitely a part of my practice, but then for me, the next part is like, okay, so if I am full here, how can I take this directly into a situation that needs it? Right, so it's using discernment to see how, you know, it's almost like, you know, we hear the tales of the Bodhisattva, right? So from this enlightenment, I will go directly into a circumstance that forces me to use this enlightenment <laughs> or this heart or this thing. Right, like doing something with your spiritual abundance requires fierce courage and almost ferocious. I say ferocious because, like I told you, I worked on Capitol Hill during the Trump era where, where ignorance was super ferocious. And so I had to be ferocious with my truth to combat ferocious ignorance or ferocious delusion. You know, like you have to, and this is where I'm glad that I'm like hardcore activist and hardcore practitioner. Because like I was like, I can't meet this ferocity of willful ignorance with silence. Like I have to meet this ferocity of ignorance with ferocious truth. From an abundant heart. Thank you, meditation, Vipassana practice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So that it, it comes from that. Like, so we, we're, we're so resourced, we're balanced and those sorts of things. You open your eyes, you see the world as it is. And you're like, hmm. I got to do something about this. Gotcha. So the fierceness and ferociousness is seeing the thing and then with with discernment, I mean, not haphazardly, but with discernment going directly in the heart of it and being like, OK, so how can the strength of this energy alchemize this terrible situation? Yeah, Great so some people, thank some, you so much. Yeah, some people think that's reckless and perhaps it is, but Reckless times call for reckless measures. Why can't I be recklessly compassionate? You know, people are recklessly crazy all the time, right? Cass, please. All right. Hi, thank Great. you. Oh, Reggie, it's such a pleasure to meet you and feel your energy. And I, I'm totally inspired. I, um, I just a couple days ago, I mean, it's been 
I, I was really courageous for myself and went and um, went to a high school and uh, to share some mindfulness practices with high school kids, right? Senior and junior AP students, right? <laughs> so um, I feel like I've I've like broke through something for myself and I'm just feel really passionate now about wanting to really come into that community. I've just spent the last seven years in healthcare while I'm still mm -hmm. there. And we do group medical visits and I've been bringing mindfulness and mind body skills there. Um, but, um, but I, yeah, I, I just, and really touch with something. And I'm the one that put in your, in the, in the box um, that I want to bring you to Minnesota. Someplace. Oh, okay. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. Re reach out to me. Okay. Thank you. For sure. Thank you. Yeah. And I, wa I want to like echo something that you said in that courage for each of us looks different. So my comfort zone, like I said, is being like, hey, I pub I'm publishing a manuscript, which is crazy. <laughs> They're like, hey, that's the edge of my comfort zone. But I worked hard, you know what I mean? For me, I'm like, Ugh! like it makes me super awkward and kind of uh, like flushed and like whatever. So our, our comfort zones are different. So that you did something outside of your comfort zone and that you feel impassioned by it, like that's the courage reward. I mean, because yeah. listen, I'll also say, listen, fear, y'all, is real and fear is necessary. Like, I'm not going to yeah. be the teacher that says, don't be afraid. You, sometimes you should be afraid, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> but fear is not meant to drive the car. Like, fear can be a co pilot for a second, it can definitely be a backseat driver, but it can't be in the stick, like the steering wheel. You know, so that you were afraid that you worked through it look at the reward of you leading into what your, your discomfort yeah 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 thank you and i i hear that in you and so i'm just encouraged by your courage and just grateful that i met you today this evening so thank Absolutely. you for dancing. thank you everybody here indeed God bless you. blessings to you as well and so this what Cass offered listen I'm a person who wants to talk to people, right? So if it's your sangha, if it's your business, whatever, like I, this energy needs to heal people. Like it doesn't need to be in my room by myself. Like let, let, let's heal the world, right? And I mean that for real. Um, Sherry, Sherry, Sherry. Hi, Sylvia. <laughs> Thank you so much for your offering tonight. Um, I just finished the MMTCP cohort too. <laughs> Woo! Really happy to see you here. And um, Cass's question really touched my heart. I have three kids, two 12 year olds and an 18 year old. Mm -hmm. And um, my practice sustains me, but to see the amount of suffering in young people right now is overwhelming um my kids and their friends and their the beliefs bullying. about the state of the world and yeah their, their despair um and you know i bring as much of that joy as i can to the experience but but they are exposed to things way beyond my ability to control so can you speak at all to i mean i i've signed up for a training uh, to teach mindfulness to young people so okay. that I can hopefully work in that arena. Um, but can you speak at all to the youngest generation and how we touch them and guide them and help them find a way? Yeah, for sure. First of all, congratulations. For those of you that don't know the MMTCP program, two years is longer than you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> right? So like props to your resilience in, in getting what a that gift. Done. Yeah, for sure. What a time. Um, so I used to teach high school and like um, I was like the teenage angst whisperer. Right. So like people were like, how do you get along with these kids? Like I remember the first time I taught high school, this woman comes up to me. She's like, so tell me about your certification. I was like, for what? She's like mm -hmm. teaching. I was like, I don't have any certification. It's my first day. And she was like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm just honest with them. And like I speak from the heart. And um, I tell I don't take any bullshit, but I also offer like tremendous love and space. 
and so much so that it's not it's not a competition but like some of the other teachers would get mad at me because like the kids would be like hey we're not going to call you reggie we're going to call you mr awesome and i'm like yo don't say that that's going to get me in trouble right and so like anyway so i had this interesting relationship with the kids so i say that to say we don't need to be honest with the kids about how the world is kind of effed up we need to be honest with them that the sun also rises Right. So they've had an overabundance of ridiculousness. Like, you know, a friend of mine. Um, so I taught a sangha in January called New Life Revelations because New Year's resolutions kind of bore me. But New Life Revelations it was like 30 days of like consistent sonic um, asana and meditative practice. And um, one of the students is a uh, vice principal and she put something in my head that really blew me away. Like so a 10 year old is having social adjustment issues and all these other things for two years of his 10 years he was in solitary confinement so that is 20 percent if i at 48 years old spent 20 percent of my life stuck unable to talk to people like of course there'd be collateral damage right and so like the compassion of like to they've these kids have seen far more of the dark side of life than we most of us have and so we need to be patient and loving for them that the sun also rises you know and not in a cliche way so at the end of a storm there's a rainbow you know like the rains water the seeds which you know like so all these metaphors um that's what they need us for so it's holding the space and you know i teach a lot of grief and death and loss work so uh, who, like when spirit tapped me on the shoulder to teach they're like we're going to give you the things no one wants to deal with so you can talk about race and you can talk about grief and you can talk about death and have fun reggie so that's how spirit gets along with me um so but in the training for that work um kids or people don't want to be told what to do they just want to know that you got their back and so I say that in the context of kids is that so much has happened to them that it's almost reflective in the way that they react. So creating conditions where they can soften, like their nervous systems are a wreck. And so we got to create conditions for them to play, right? Not think of, you know, and we as adults got to do better, right? With policy and all this, all the, all the arenas I work in in Washington, D.C., but regardless of that we've got to teach kids that the sun also rises and that comes from offering loving open space to hear hear their suffering and feel their grief because they may not have the words for it but they um are grieving something that they feel that they lost yeah is that helpful very helpful i appreciate it thank you absolutely thank you sherry and um, yeah, just talking about high schoolers, I wanted to just read something that came into my email yesterday. Um, somebody by the name of Emily Kingsley wrote it, and it's not it's not long. It says, I felt like a god yesterday when I put a new AA battery in the clock on my wall. For a few days, the second hand had been struggling to make it up past the number seven. It climbed a few tick marks and then fell, shuddering back down to the number six. I was stuck in perpetual 1030. With a new battery in place, the second hand marched proudly up the left side of the clock and then circled back down the right. I did that, I thought, energized and exhausted at the same time. A minute is just so damn short and so freaking long at the same time. I work at a high school and to quote my teacher friend, it's bad, bad. To be fair, it's not all bad. My students can be delightful. Yesterday, one wrote me a poem, and the day before that, one brought me a month-old candy cane. But it's also bad. Take a group of teenagers, layer in anxiety, trauma, depression, poverty, Puberty. and neglect, and you've got a tiramisu of sadness. Serve it up to overworked, tired teachers, and then also let a bunch of old white men pass laws about what should happen in the classroom. Also cut funding so there's not enough printer ink to go around. It's bad. As an administrator, I get to spend most of the day at my desk pretending I know how to fix it all. 
Today, I wrote a grant to get a 3D printer. That will fix it, right? But idiot or optimist, I still come home with hope each day. It's because of this one little word, and, and. Everything is terrible, and I can still change the clock battery. Students come to my office with problems I can't begin to unpack. No, I can't tell you why you have bad dreams after murdering about murdering people. No, I can't explain why your dad told you it's your mom's fault you slice your arms up like belly meat. No, I don't know why the doctor screwed up your prescription and you are out of your meds and your sister won't drive you to Boston to get you more. What they need is years of therapy and mental health care that their insurance will never cover. They need stable housing, better health care, braces, and acne medication. <laughs> what they have is me. What I have is and. So that's what I tell them. You can feel sad and you can do five math problems. You can be nervous and write the last paragraph of your essay. You can be anxious and pick up trash in the hallway. You can feel mad and eat a piece of fruit. And mm. nothing will really be fixed. But then it wasn't really hard to get fixed. It wasn't really going to get fixed anyway. But and maybe I think this is longer than you thought. But like, I'm sorry. You, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, I'm don't it's almost at the end. But okay. Yeah. Um let's see. But maybe there's they'll be a little bit better at algebra or feel a little bit healthier. It's not magic advice, but sometimes the nudge is enough to put things in motion. After all, no matter what my dead battery wall clock says, it can't stay 1030 forever. Today is terrible and tomorrow will come. Gratitude. So, yeah. Sorry, I was it no seemed short and it got, it got long, but it just seemed appropriate with what some of the high school stuff and just yeah. students in general. Well, and we can't hold space for suffering if we don't know what's happening, right? And so like, I wasn't, I mean, I'm just saying this, we're, we're near the end of the hour. Um, and so I just wanted to be honest um, with that, but thank you for the share because that, my, that email is a microcosm of what other people are feeling. So what I'd like to do with your permission, first of all, thank you all for the rich discussion for the heartfelt shares. And again, I hope that me being with you gave you not only a different flavor of spiritual practice, but just either a wisdom or just different way of thinking about these things that's less passive and more either active energetically or active otherwise. Um, the name of my teaching practice is Active Peace. So I can't help it. Active Peace and the rejoinder is Fierce Compassion. So um, what I'd like to do is for the remainder of our time together, can we have a silent sit? And I'm going to play my oldest singing bowl. I mean, I can't have all these singing bowls and gongs behind me and not play for you. That's like ignorant and rude. So find your posture to allow you to sit in community one last time. And as we sit in community silently, if there are two or three things that are on your heart, internalize them if your heart is open send loving kindness to someone who needs it and let's just experience the magic of community one last time silence sit begins now The bowl I just told is 320 years old. So may the wisdom of this bowl resonate with you. To bring closure to my section of the program, I'll ring it three more times. 
for Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha with gratitude for the chance to be of service. 